15, 2009, 11 o'clock a.m. There was nothing special about this Thursday morning at one of the busiest railway stations in the heart of London, the Liverpool Street Station. Then, all of a sudden, a voice rang out over the PA. Wait, that's not just a voice, that's a song. A single person started doing what looked like a stretch. All of a sudden, the music broke out. It was a remake of the 1959 classic by the Isley Brothers called Shout. That's not stretching, that's a dance. A few more people started dancing along. Within a couple minutes, a flash mob had broken out. Anyone who wasn't involved was doing what the only thing that you would expect them to do, pulling out their phones and recording those who were dancing. The world found out about the event as it was shared by those who were there. Then, on the very next day, the people behind the seemingly random breakout in song uploaded the final video. For anyone who happened to be there at the time, it seemed spontaneous. And for them, it was. Well, we all know, in the real world, people don't break out into song spontaneously. This particular event was the result of eight weeks of planning, choreographed to eight classical music tracks, 400 dancers picked out of over 10,000 who auditioned, and 10 hidden cameras to capture it all. You might know it as the commercial simply called Dance from T-Mobile. Today, it has about 41 million views on YouTube, and you can add to that total by finding it on the show's notes for this episode at basedonatruestorypodcast.com or just searching T-Mobile Dance on YouTube. One of the masterminds and the director behind that commercial was a man named Michael Gracie. Michael used to be a VFX artist, having started his career at Animal Logic, a VFX studio based out of Australia. Haven't heard of them? They're a big name in the VFX world, having worked on movies like The Matrix, Happy Feet, Moulin Rouge, The Avengers, Age of Ultron, Iron Man 3, Hunger Games, Catching Fire, and pretty much all of the Lego movies. That's just a few, but I think you get the point. But Michael worked there for really only a couple years, from 1994 to 1996, so before many of those films. From 1996 to 2001, Michael worked at another Australian VFX company called Complete Post, which worked on the Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes reinterpretation of the Shakespearean classic Romeo and Juliet, the Australian classic comedy The Dish, and the Nicole Kidman and Hugh Jackman World War II film simply called Australia. While The Dish and Australia might make for great future episodes based on a true story, today we're going to be looking at another Hugh Jackman film. Today we're going to be looking at a movie coming out in a couple weeks, on Christmas Day to be in fact. Since Christmas Day is one of the most popular days to go see movies, I thought this would be a great opportunity to get to know a bit more about one of the films coming out then. And if you've seen any of the trailers for movies coming out on Christmas Day starring Hugh Jackman, you've probably figured out by now that today we're going to be learning about the upcoming film, The Greatest Showman. Oh, and by the way, The Greatest Showman also marks the big screen directorial debut from Michael Gracie, the VFX artist turned commercial director behind the T-Mobile commercial dance, not to mention plenty of other commercials. So, as you're wrapping presents out shopping or preparing for Christmas, or maybe you're on your way to the theater to go see the movie, let's take some time to learn about P.T. Barnum, the real person that Hugh Jackman is playing in the movie. I'm Dan Lefebvre, and this is based on a true story. Before we learn about the real P.T. Barnum, let's set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm going to share three facts with you. Two of them are true. One of them is a lie. Okay, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, P.T. Barnum and Jenny Lind were both real people. Number two, P.T. Barnum started his showman career by purchasing a slave. Number three, P.T. Barnum never married. Got them? Listen for the two truths scattered throughout the episode. Then, by process of elimination, you'll know which one is a lie. I don't include the lie because I don't want to include incorrect information on purpose on the episode. So, but don't worry, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. By the way, if you've listened to the show before, you might have heard some of the other future-looking episodes from movies like Dunkirk, Anthropoid, or Deepwater Horizon. Since this is also a future-looking episode, this is a great chance to clarify the differences between an episode like today's episode and a traditional episode of Based on a True Story. Normally, we'll compare history with Hollywood by looking at the major plot points in the movie and then comparing them with history. But every so often, like today, 
we'll look at a movie that hasn't come out yet. So we're looking ahead. That means you probably haven't seen the movie before listening to this episode, but I don't have an inside scoop to see movies ahead of time. So that also means that I haven't seen the movie before creating the episode. So whenever we have a future looking episode that releases before the movie, we're simply looking at the history behind the movie. We're not really comparing the major plot points in the film since I haven't seen the film, so I don't know the major plot points. Instead, what we're doing is we're learning the real history so that when you go see the movie for the first time, you'll be able to do your own comparison. So in this case, if you've seen anything about The Greatest Showman, you'll know that it's not a biographical drama about Hugh Jackman's character, P.T. Barnum, but it's also a musical. Well, obviously, P.T. Barnum's life wasn't really a musical, but what other historical facts were changed for the movie? I can't wait to find out when I see the film, and I can't wait to hear what you think of it after you see it. But first, for you to be able to determine the film's historical accuracy when you see it, you'll need to know the true story. So let's prepare ourselves for making our own comparisons by learning the real story first. To do that, let's look at the real P.T. Barnum, the man that inspired The Greatest Showman. When John Taylor moved from England to New England in 1630, he came along with John Winthrop, who, in turn, was one of the leading figures founding the Massachusetts Bay Colony. John Taylor, on the other hand, moved to Windsor, Connecticut, where he married Rhonda Hobbs and settled down to start a family. Windsor, by the way, is just north of Hartford along the Connecticut River. Sadly, John would pass away just seven years later when his ship making the voyage back to England was lost at sea. But not before John and Rhonda had a son, also named John, and along with extending the family line, the Taylor name became known as one of the earliest settlers in New England. John Jr. would go on to have Thomas, Thomas would go on to have Nathan, Nathan would have a son also named Nathan, and Nathan Jr. decided to go a little different route with names when he named his son Phineas. Of course, it's not like each of those only had one child. Thomas, for example, had 10 children. I just pointed out one for each generation to get to Phineas because it was Phineas who had a daughter named Irina Taylor. In 1809, Irina Taylor married Philo Barnum, and the two settled down in Bethel, Connecticut. That's about 70 miles or 112 kilometers to the southwest of Windsor. Oh, and without getting too sidetracked, Irina was Philo's second wife. His first wife, Phoebe, or Polly as everyone called her, passed away on June 23, 1808, at only 27 years of age. But Philo and Polly had two kids together, Minerva and Philo Jr. So, really, it was the four of them who settled into life in Bethel as Irina became Minerva and young Philo's stepmother. About a year after being married, on July 5, 1810, Philo and Irina named their first child together after Irina's father, Phineas Taylor, when they named him Phineas Taylor Barnum, or, as we know him today, P.T. Barnum. Philo Barnum had learned the value of hard work from his father, Ephraim Barnum, who was a captain during the Revolutionary War. That was something Philo passed on to young Phineas. At only six years of age, young Phineas had learned how to drive cows to and from the pasture on his family's farm. He also helped around the farm shelling corn, weeding their garden, and as he got a little bit older, riding the plow horse and plenty of other chores, all things that I'm sure most country kids are probably familiar with. Something else that he learned at a young age was the value of money. Again, at only age six, there was one story of how he saved up enough for a silver dollar. This he used to fund a little business of gingerbread, homemade molasses, candy, and even something he referred to as cherry rum. By age 12, he'd peddled enough treats to buy things no other 12-year-old in the region had. A sheep, a calf, and some other things that he wanted, like clothes. While the items he purchased didn't really make much sense as a way to keep his little store aloft long-term, it was clear he was a quick learner when it came to money. And he liked that sort of work a lot more then he liked working on the farm. According to his autobiography, quote, As I grew older, my settled aversion to manual labor, farm, or other kind was manifest in various ways, which were set down to the general score of laziness. In despair of doing better with me, my father concluded to make a merchant of me, 
He erected a building in Bethel and with Mr. Hiram Weed as a partner, purchased a stock of dry goods, hardware, groceries, and general notions and installed me as clerk in this country store, end quote. As it turns out, Phineas had a knack for selling. But perhaps the biggest thing he learned there was, quote, that sharp trades, tricks, dishonesty, and deception are by no means confined to the city, end quote. It would seem Phineas caught on quick, learning that sometimes the best way to make a sale is to add a bit of deception to the mix. Then tragedy struck. When Phineas was 15, his father passed away on September 7th, 1825. He'd been sick for about six months, but he was still only 48 years old at the time of his death. His mother was still alive, as were his siblings. We haven't really talked much about them, but Philo and Irina had one more child after Phineas. So those two, plus the two Philo had with his previous marriage, meant the Barnum family, at the time of Philo's early passing, was a 44-year-old Irina, a 24-year-old Minerva, a 22-year-old Philo Jr., an 18-year-old Phineas, and a 14-year-old Eater. Now, I couldn't find exactly what happened to Minerva and Philo Jr., but we know after his father passed away, Phineas essentially left home and went off into the world to make his own way. So I would venture to guess maybe something similar happened to his older siblings, if not at the time of his father's passing, but possibly even before, since they were older, and maybe the 14-year-old Eater stayed home with Irina. Well, I guess maybe I should say Phineas left home Again, there's too many stories about Phineas to include everything in detail in a single episode, but at age 16, Phineas moved to Brooklyn for a while to be a clerk at a grocery store. But he returned home after coming down with the smallpox. That was before his father passed away. But now, with his father gone, Phineas would have to make a living on his own, for good this time. So he tried to do whatever he could to earn a living. He worked as a clerk in New York, ran a general store, kept a boarding house, and worked at a small porterhouse. All the while behind the scenes, he was trading, peddling, and even started his own lottery business. In fact, the lottery was something he would continue to do to make money on the side. In his autobiography, Phineas explained how it worked. I made a very remarkable trade at one time for my employers by purchasing, in their absence, a whole wagon load of green glass bottles of various sizes for which I paid in unsaleable goods at very profitable prices. How to dispose of the bottles was then a problem, and as it was also desirable to get rid of a large quantity of tin ware which had been in the shop for years and was considerably, quote, shop-worn, end quote, I conceived the idea of a lottery in which the highest prize should be $25, payable in any goods the winner desired. Well, there were to be 50 prizes of $5 each, payable in goods, to be designated in the scheme. Then there were 100 prizes of $1 each, 100 prizes of $0.50 each, and 300 prizes of $0.25 each. It is unnecessary to state that the minor prizes consisted mainly of glass and tinware. The tickets sold like wildfire, and the worn tin and glass bottles were speedily turned into cash. Then, only a year after his father's death in 1829, Phineas ran into a woman he'd met years before and described in his autobiography as, quote, a fair, rosy-cheeked, buxom girl with beautiful white teeth, end quote. That girl was a tailoress named Charity Hallett, and in the movie, Charity is played by Michelle Williams. Now, in 1829, something important happened in the history of the United States. Well, I'm sure many things happened, but what I'm referring to is when Andrew Jackson took office as the seventh president of the United States. When he did, replacing John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson became the very first president as a part of a new political party, the Democratic Party. And yes, that's the same Democratic Party that exists today. As you can imagine, while politics are always a point of discussion in the nation, it was a very hot topic around the changing of the presidency along with a new political party coming onto the scene. For his part, Phineas wrote a lot of letters to the local newspaper with his thoughts on the happenings and political things, but they didn't get published. The newspaper rejected most of them. So Phineas decided to start his own newspaper, 
And on October 19th, 1831, he published the very first edition of his own paper, The Herald of Freedom. That didn't go so well. His paper made some enemies, and he was slapped with a $100 fine and a 60-day jail sentence by a judge after losing a libel suit for accusations that he'd printed. But as they say, there's no such thing as bad advertising, and there was quite a scene when Phineas got out of jail. This is an excerpt from Phineas's own newspaper that reported on the grand ceremony that greeted him on the day he left jail. P.T. Barnum and the band of music took their seats in a coach drawn by six horses, which had been prepared for the occasion. The coach was preceded by 40 horsemen and a marshal bearing the national standard. Immediately in the rear of the coach was the carriage of the orator and the president of the day, followed by the committee of arrangements and 60 carriages of citizens, which joined in escorting the editor to his home in Bethel. When the procession commenced its march amidst a roar of cannons, three cheers were given by several hundred citizens who did not join in the procession. The band of music continued to play a variety of national airs until their arrival in Bethel, a distance of three miles, when they struck up the beautiful and appropriate tune of Home Sweet Home. After giving three hearty cheers, the procession returned to Danbury. The utmost harmony and unanimity of feeling prevailed throughout the day, and we are happy to add that no accident occurred to mar the festivities of the occasion. Now, I don't know how much Phineas himself had to do with that, the procession, really, if anything at all, but it's safe to say that he did have a flair for showmanship. As a result... His local newspaper subscriptions went up thanks to many folks heralding him as a hero for exposing corruption. But then, in 1833, the state of Connecticut made lotteries illegal. That cut deep into Phineas's pockets as he'd continued to use lotteries as a way of making money to support his family and growing businesses. Without much hope of recouping the lost income, Phineas decided to leave his newspaper and sell his store in 1834 as he moved his family from Bethel, Connecticut for New York City. It was here in New York in the year 1835 that Phineas found his true calling, according to his autobiography. By this time, it was clear to my mind that my proper position in this busy world was not yet reached. I had displayed the faculty of getting money as well as getting rid of it, but the business for which I was destined and, I believe, made, had not yet come to me, or, rather, I had not found that I was to cater for that insatiate want of human nature, the love of amusement, that I was to make a sensation on two continents, and that fame and fortune awaited me so soon as I should appear before the public in the character of a showman. These things I had not foreseen. I did not seek the position or the character. The business finally came in my way. I fell into the occupation, and far beyond any of my predecessors on this continent, I have succeeded. To say he fell into the occupation might be a reference to something that P.T. Barnum stumbled upon to start his show. It happened when a man named Mr. Coley Bartram told Phineas that he owned an African-American woman named Joyce Heth, who was over 160 years old and the nurse of none other than George Washington. This was in 1835. George Washington died 36 years earlier in 1799. And by owned, yes, I, I mean owned, Joyce was a slave. And this was 26 years before the Civil War, which started in 1861. By the way, Joyce Heth is played by the talented Oscar nominee Diane Carroll in the movie, Mr. Bartram was a partner with another man named R.W. Lindsay, who, together, were selling tickets for people to see Joyce Heth in Philadelphia. According to P.T. Barnum's autobiography, which, I'll warn you, contains some 1830s-style racism, explains Joyce like this. Joyce Heth was certainly a remarkable curiosity, and she looked as if she might have been far older than her age as advertised. She was apparently in good health and spirits, but from age or disease or both was unable to change her position. She could not move one arm at will, but her lower limbs could not be straightened. Her forearm lay across her breast, and she could not remove it. The fingers of her left hand were drawn down so as nearly to close it, and were fixed, 
The nails on that hand were almost four inches long and extended above her waist. The nails on her large toes had grown to the thickness of a quarter of an inch. Her head was covered in a thick bush of gray hair, but she was toothless and totally blind, and her eyes had sunk so deeply in the sockets as to have disappeared altogether. Nevertheless, she was pert and sociable, and would talk as long as people would converse with her. She was quite garrulous about her protege, quote, dear little George, end quote, at whose birth she declared she was present, having been at the time a slave of Elizabeth Atwood, a half-sister of Augustine Washington, the father of George Washington. As nurse, she put the first clothes on the infant, and she claimed to have, quote, raised him, end quote. She professed to be a member of the Baptist Church, talking much in her way on religious subjects and sang a variety of ancient hymns. In proof of her extraordinary age and pretensions, Mr. Lindsay exhibited a bill of sale dated February 5, 1727, from Augustine, Washington, County of Westmoreland, Virginia, to Elizabeth Atwood, a half-sister and neighbor of Mr. Washington, conveying, quote, one Negro woman named Joyce Heth, aged 54 years old, for and in consideration of the sum of 33 pounds lawful money of Virginia, end quote. It was further claimed that as she had long been a nurse in the Washington family, she was called in at the birth of George and clothed the newborn infant. The evidence seemed authentic, and in answer to the inquiry why so remarkable a discovery had not been made before, a satisfactory explanation was given in the statement that she had been carried from Virginia to Kentucky, had been on the plantation of John S. Bowling so long that no one knew or cared to know how old she was, and only recently the accidental discovery by Mr. Bowling's son of the old bill of sale in the record office in Virginia had led to the identification of this Negro woman as, quote, the nurse of Washington, end quote. Everything seemed so straightforward that I was anxious to become a proprietor of this novel exhibition, which was offered to me at $1,000, though the price first demanded was 3000 I had $500, borrowed $500 more, sold out my interest in the grocery business to my partner, and began life as a showman. At the outset of my career, I saw that everything depended upon getting people to think and talk and become curious and excited over and about the, quote, rare spectacle, end quote. Accordingly, posters, transparencies, advertisements, newspaper paragraphs, all calculated to extort attention, were employed regardless of expense. My exhibition rooms in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Albany, and in other large and small cities were continually thronged and much money was made. In the following February, Joyce Heth died literally of old age, and her remains received a respectable burial in the town of Bethel. At a post-mortem examination of Joyce Heth by Dr. David L. Rogers, in the presence of some medical students, it was thought that the absence of ossification indicated considerably less age than had been assumed for her, but the doctors disagreed, and this, quote, dark subject, end quote, will probably always continue to be shrouded in mystery. P.T. Barnum bought Joyce for $1,000, or about $23,600 today. Some of that money was borrowed, which gives you an idea of how well off he was financially at the time. He toured with Joyce with some reports suggesting that P.T. Barnum made about $1,500 a week selling tickets to people wanting to see the nurse that was, quote, called in at the birth of George Washington, end quote. On February 19th, 1836, as the autobiography mentions, Joyce hath passed away. But that didn't stop P.T. Barnum from profiting from her death. Now, in the autobiography, P.T. Barnum mentions that there was a post-mortem examination done in the presence of some medical students. However, the true story is a little bit different. So, as more and more people paid to see the 160-year-old woman, more and more people didn't believe that Joyce was actually 160 years old. So, when Joyce died... P.T. Barnum hired a man named Dr. David Rogers to perform an autopsy in public. There were about 15 people in attendance, and yes, they had to pay to be there. P.T. Barnum sold tickets to the autopsy for about 50 cents. Maybe they were medical students, but they still had to pay, and that's about $10 in today's money for each ticket. Well, as you might expect, Dr. Rogers found Joyce to be not nearly the 160-year-old woman that Phineas claimed, or P.T. claimed, 
in an attempt to cover his tracks, P.T. Barnum then said that the woman Dr. Rogers did the autopsy on wasn't actually Joyce and that she was off in Europe. Some suggest P.T. Barnum eventually owned up to the hoax, but others disagree and point to Phineas's insistence on the validity of the original bill of sale from when George Washington's father, Augustine, uh, bought Joyce, as well as the claim that he never coaxed Joyce, uh, P.T. Barnum never coaxed Joyce, that is, to say any of the things that she did. Most historians today believe Joyce was no older than 80, probably about 79 when she passed. Sadly, we just don't know much about her. It does seem that she made claims about being George Washington's nurse, but with today's modern medicine, we know about so many ailments and illnesses that can cause one's memory to deteriorate to the point of easily being coerced to say whatever others tell you. And from P.T. Barnum's own autobiography and the description of Joyce's finger and toenails, I think it's clear that she just wasn't really taken care of very well. It's really sad if you think about it. Of course, P.T. Barnum claimed he didn't coerce Joyce to say the sh things she did, and even if he didn't, that doesn't mean Mr. Bartram, the man who sold Joyce to P.T. Barnum, didn't coerce Joyce to say those things that weren't true. Anyway, this, as I said, the story of Joyce Heth is really a sad one, and it's one that has made P.T. Barnum plenty of money while simultaneously kicking off his career in show business. So... What then of the other characters that we see in the movie? There's Zac Efron playing someone named Philip Carlyle and Zendaya playing Anne Wheeler. As best as I can tell, those are both fictional characters. At least I couldn't find anything in any of P.T. Barnum's books or any other historical records of an Anne Wheeler or Philip Carlyle. If you have more information on about either of these characters, by all means, join the Based on a True Story Facebook group and let us know. That brings us to Rebecca Ferguson's character named Jenny Lind. She was a real person and was a great singer, but she didn't come into the picture right away. About a month before Joyce Heth passed away in February of 1836, P.T. Barnum hired a man named Signor Antonio. Now, Signor was a juggler, balancer, stilt walker, and P.T. Barnum added him to the show after convincing Signor to change his name to Signor Vivalva, something that P.T. thought was more exotic sounding. For a while, the show was pretty much just the two of them traveling around with the former, uh, Senor, being the talent, and the latter, P.T., Barnum, being the salesman, getting people to come watch and buy tickets to the show. Then, at one show, another juggler in the crowd heckled Senor, saying that he could do it better. So, Phineas had an idea, and he pitched a fake competition between two jugglers. Behind the scenes, the two jugglers were in on it, but as far as the public was concerned, it was a competition between two talented jugglers with a $1,000 pot on the line. It worked for a while, but as is often the case, before long, the public wanted more. So P.T. Barnum hired a singer and dancer who donned blackface named James Sanford. He didn't stay around for too long, but Unfortunately, I'm sure it didn't have much to do with the blackface. Adding more things to his show, P.T. Barnum brought on horses, a clown, and another singer, a black woman, and toured the show around the United States for a few months. Their show stopped in 1837 with the crew disbanding and going their separate ways. Then, later in 1837, later in the same year, Phineas tried another tactic, this time buying a steamboat and bringing on some performers as they went up and down the Mississippi River. As 1838 rolled around, the riverboat idea didn't seem to be making him happy enough, so he sold the boat and went back to the drawing board. P.T. Barnum put together another troupe, headlined by an African-American man named John Diamond, who was a dancer. With John taking the stage, Phineas had the idea of doing something that he'd done with the jugglers before, staging a fake competition. That didn't work so well, and by the time 1841 hit, the show had again disbanded and Phineas returned home where he sold Bibles for a time. Then, on December 27, 1841, P.T. Barnum managed to secure a local museum that had gone up for sale. That was the Broadway American Museum, and it was here that P.T. Barnum found a place to build a show with some stability. According to P.T. Barnum's autobiography, quote, 
The American Museum was the ladder by which I rose to fortune. The museum was always open at sunrise, and this was so well known throughout the country that strangers coming to the city would often take a tour through my halls before going to breakfast or to their hotels. I do not believe there was ever a more truly popular place of amusement, end quote. One of the more popular performances came in 1842 when P.T. Barnum met Charles Stratton, who Phineas gave the stage name of General Tom Thumb. Charles, who is played by Stan Humphrey in the movie, was only four years old when Phineas met him, and according to some historians, was actually P.T. Barnum's half-fifth cousin twice removed, which could be how he found out about Charles. Charles had stopped growing at about six months old and was only two feet tall or about 61 centimeters. Throughout his life, Charles would only grow to be three foot three inches tall or about 99 centimeters. Phineas taught Charles how to sing, dance, do impersonations that along with Phineas advertising Charles to actually be an 11 year old, even though he was four when they met, made him a hit on stage. It was in 1844 when P.T. Barnum and Charles Stratton were performing in England when the pair were invited to visit Buckingham Palace and perform for Queen Victoria. The Queen is played by Gail Rankin in the movie, by the way. It was on this trip that Phineas heard about Jenny Lind. Jenny, who, as we learned earlier, is played by Rebecca Ferguson in the film, was a very popular opera singer at the time in Europe. Without even hearing her sing, Phineas wanted to get her to join his show in New York based on her reputation alone. His thought was that she could help lend some credibility to Phineas's other attractions in the museum, somebody who already had a good reputation like Jenny did. Then, after hearing her sing, Phineas was hooked. He offered Jenny $1,000 per performance to come to America and sing. That's about $26,000 in today's money per performance. That's a lot of money. And most historians don't believe that P.T. Barnum really could have afforded her for long. But it paid off because Jenny's performances ended up earning P.T. Barnum over $500,000 or about $13 million today. Needless to say, at this point, P.T. Barnum was set and his show was something that everyone knew. Over the rest of his life, P.T. Barnum continued to build his show, including going back to doing traveling performances, but he also did plenty of other things that have made people wonder just how authentic he was. For example, in 1861, when the Civil War broke out, Phineas became a staunch Unionist speaking out against slavery. Except, if you recall, he started his showmanship by purchasing Joyce Heth, a slave, and while I didn't really mention it, he also followed the common practice of the time of banning African Americans from his museum. Politics was something he was often wrapped up in, even becoming the mayor of Bridgeport, Connecticut for a time. Another contradiction of his was when he campaigned heavily against letting saloons be open on Sundays, even though he himself was quite the heavy drinker during his European tours. Or there was when his wife, Charity, passed away unexpectedly from heart failure in 1873, she was 65. Understandably, Phineas was heartbroken when the woman that he loved passed away. In his autobiography, he wrote that, quote, without charity, I am nothing, end quote. So what's contradictory about that? Well, some would point to the fact that P.T. Barnum, who was 63 at the time, married a 22-year-old woman named Nancy Fish about 14 weeks after charity passed away. Not too long afterwards. Kind of makes you wonder if they were an item before she passed away. He tried to keep this marriage a secret for a time, but a little less than a year later, they did have a public wedding. In 1890, P.T. Barnum suffered a stroke that led to his death the following year on April 7, 1891. He was, without a doubt, someone who cared more about public opinion than the average person. Just before his death, Phineas gave permission to the Evening Sun newspaper to print his obituary just so that he could read it before he died to make sure it was all right. For someone like P.T. Barnum, there's little doubt that his life was something that has impacted the world. Whether that's for the positive or negative is something for each of us to decide. As you can probably guess, there's so many more stories about P.T. Barnum's life. We've really only scratched the surface here, but... This is where we must end our story today. Before we do, 
Here's some food for thought as you go see The Greatest Showman in theaters. Consider the facts as we know them. P.T. Barnum did many things in his life that were horrible, like owning slaves, profiting off of making people mock others' appearance, just to name a few. But we know a lot about these things because he himself laid them out in his autobiography called Struggles and Triumphs or 40 Years Recollections of P.T. Barnum. Those are, that's the autobiography that we've heard some excerpt from in this episode. During those times, however, in the 1800s, early 1800s, many of the things that he admitted to in his autobiography were not seen as horrible as they actually are. And so, knowing that Phineas Taylor Barnum liked to bend the truth, how many other things do you think he did that didn't make its way into his autobiography? Or, put another way, was P.T. Barnum really the greatest showman? Or was his life just a show for the public that hit a darker, more disturbing underbelly? This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. Even though we don't really know how much of P.T. Barnum's autobiographies are really accurate, I'd venture to guess that it probably is pretty accurate, and if anything, if there was any sort of negative aspect in his life that, of how he went from rags to riches that he didn't really want people to know about if there was a dark underbelly there, I have a feeling he just omitted that from history rather than uh, telling it incorrectly. You can find his autobiography for free on Gutenberg's website. I'll add links to that book and many other resources for you to dive into the life of the real P.T. Barnum over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Before we get to the answer to the two truths and a lie game, here's another five-star review. This one comes from Jackie Eames on Facebook, and it says, I love this podcast. Nice, in-depth look at the real story behind those films that are based on a true story. Really enjoyable way to while away an otherwise dull commute. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie helping to bring some entertainment to make those everyday things like a commute or chores, making them just a little more enjoyable. That's exactly what this show is supposed to do. So I'm glad it's doing that for you. Thanks so much for the kind words. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, P.T. Barnum and Jenny Lind were both real people. Number two, P.T. Barnum started his showman career by purchasing a slave. Number three, P.T. Barnum never married. Did you find out which one is a lie? The lie is number three. As we learned, P.T. Barnum actually married a couple times, the first being to Charity, who was in the movie, and after she passed away, he remarried a woman named Nancy, who remained his wife until his death. So now that you know a little bit more about the real Phineas Taylor Barnum, Go watch The Greatest Showman and let me know what you think in the movie. I'm sure that despite P.T. Barnum's deeds, the movie itself will be filled with some great music and I would love to hear not only what you think of the movie, but I'd love to hear what you think of P.T. Barnum's life. What do you think about the things that he did in order to rise from rags to riches? Let me know in the Based on a True Story Facebook group. You can also follow the show on Instagram. It's at Based on a True Story Podcast. Over there, I like to post images of the real faces and places from The Greatest Showman and other movies that we cover here on the show. You can also find me on Twitter where I'm at Dan Lefebvre, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B. Or if social media isn't your thing, you can shoot me a good old-fashioned email at dan at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon. <laughs>